Okay, welcome Church International Christian Centre here in Meritsburg, Maddox, but at the end of the lunch bar. <laughs> and to those of you watching online, part two of our daily needs. And uh, this is very powerful. And I'm, I'm going to give scripture. Last week I gave more of, you know, uh, the needs that we have as you, human beings in the natural. But part two is, is I want you to catch the scriptures where God promises our needs. And uh, I must also say for the record that uh, when it comes to tithes and offerings, this is my 50th year of bringing tithes and offerings and where God says, prove me now in if I will not get those seven things he promises in Malachi 3. So I want to just stand and testify that for 50 years of me bringing tithes and offerings from the age of 17, to my age now, 67 years old, I have proved God is a God and a Father of faithfulness when you serve Him and you obey His word. And uh, just to recap, we had uh, that prayer meeting for those of you who are only tuning on now to this, uh, listening to this message, the second part, go and listen to part two. But I, I mentioned this and I want to mention it again that in our prayer meeting, we started singing uh, one of the songs and I just felt by the Spirit of God that that song needed to be repeated the whole prayer meeting, the worship and prayer meeting. And it was the song by Jonathan Butler called I Need You Lord. We sang it about 17 times. I asked Tatha to look at the timing and 17 interesting is the biblical numeric for the sovereignty of God. And I wish I could have recorded what, what God had spoken through me for an hour and a half. The Lord was just telling us over and over and over again how much He provides every single need. And the reaction that we have to have is we've got to be conscious every moment that everything you have in life is a need that's been provided for. Everything, the water you drink, the air you breathe, the clothes you have, glasses, false teeth, whatever, <laughs> you know. And we, we, we sometimes have to improvise in our lives. Everything is a provision of God. And that's why we need to be uh, dependent and, and understand that, that uh, there's a scripture in Psalms, God says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Huh, what does that mean? Thanksgiving, praise, confessions of faith. Open your mouth wide. wide to the things of God. And if you understand this, the whole of creation depends on each part to survive. That's another thing God brought out, that we all need each other, whether saved or unsaved. You don't go to a dentist and you and if you've got a big toothache and you I mean imagine how how little of help you would get in life if every person you ask are oh, you a Christian, if you're not you then you can't help me. You you will eventually like be like a hermit because the Bible says that God rains his blessing and his goodness to a certain degree on the just and the unjust for the sake of the just <laughs> you know for the sake of the just that's why the scripture says I'll give you cities you never built houses you never had to build imagine having to do everything yourself imagine that imagine if you bake your own bread from scratch to survive yeah, we just go to the shop, boom, we buy bread. Imagine if you get the water yourself and build your own house yourself and, 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 and make your own clothes, do everything yourself that you have in life. It would, it would take you forever. So we need one another. That's why whenever you go and you buy something, we need to be kind and manly to people that are working and that are there to, to earn money to put food on their table. And sometimes we get very arrogant with people because they're taking too long or, or they've got an attitude. And, and you know, the Bible says we pay evil with good. It's tough sometimes. But God is using people to provide our needs on a daily basis and we don't even realize it. So never forget that. So that should make you a very appreciative person, humble. Oh gosh, you know, pride is the most arrogant thing. I was 
talking with a guy who was fixing a roof the other day. In fact, the guy who built our church roof he was fixing our roof. He had a bad, quite a bad leak from the previous owner. And uh, he took a walk in our complex and all that. And he was showing me stuff and seeing birds that he, he hadn't seen for a long time. And uh, it, it was Lawrence, you know, uh, Lawrence released. And I said to Lawrence, I said, you know, Lawrence, atheists have the highest form of pride. Because to say there is no God, that's the highest form of pride. It's arrogant. It's, can you, it's actually, in fact, it's more than pride. It's dumb stupidity. It, it, you know, it's pride because it, when you look at the beauty of creation and the blend of creation, it's phenomenal <laughs> to see that there's a, someone, a being who designed the intricacy of creation and everything blends together. Different substances, you know, but they blend together. The air is different from the earth and, and, and stuff like that. And it, it fascinates me. You know, a rock is, is different, but there's iron in a rock. And, and, and iron is different from material, but yet you look at how many different um, uh, substances we use just to make a car, rubber on the tires, uh, electronics, you know, LED screens and, and, and the different materials that can be put together. Imagine if they made your seat out of metal. You'd be driving five minutes and be out, out. You know, imagine a metal seat. Everything metal in the car, you know, and uh, so, so it, it's amazing how God gave us the ingredients in creation to live a life where all our needs can be supplied. I don't know if that gets to you, but it kind of gets to me. So creation and mankind need the sun, water, and air; otherwise, neither could survive. Just those three ingredients, just those three. And you know, speaking of the sun. Uh, you've heard me quote the scripture before, but I'll quote it again because the sun is always symbolic of Jesus. You know, the, the, it's interesting in creation, watch this, that uh, on the fourth day, God created the sun. Jesus came in the fourth thousand, the fourth millennium from Adam. <laughs> so that was like a type of and a shadow of, of Jesus coming. And nothing in the earth would, be, would survive without the sun, nothing, everything hinges on the sun rising. And then there's a scripture where God says, if the sun should rise, then my covenant with you of goodness, mercy, salvation, and the rest is broken. So we, one thing that we have as a witness, because God calls the sun my faithful witness in the sky. So every time the sun rises, even if it's overcast, we know the sun's up there because it's light. That God says, I will not leave you, I will not forsake you, I will provide all your needs. The Son is a witness to this very promise of God. Interesting. He says that, that my covenant will not be broken from you. Wow. Matthew 6, verse 8, Jesus speaking. And he's, he's, uh, Matthew 6, whenever you're getting in a huff and a puff and fretting and worrying and and it seems like you've been overwhelmed with debt or whatever. Read Matthew 6. It's got a powerful uh, instructional and a promise and a, a comforting word where, where Jesus is saying, and five times in, in, in that chapter, Jesus says, Don't worry. He commands us, Don't worry. Don't fret. Don't fuss. Don't panic. My brother in law jokes sometimes. He says, Calm down to a panic. <laughs> and some of us like, you know, we, we live in panic trauma mode, you know, and you've got to understand God is your father. He'll never let you go, He'll never leave you. He, he, he said nothing will separate you from our love. When you read Romans chapter 8, from about verses 30 to 38, somewhere around there, God, as the number 17, you get interesting, 17 things God mentions in the scriptures that will never so separate us from his love. 17, his sovereign love is upon us for time and eternity. So yeah, people were probably talking and Jesus is addressing, uh, and you must understand when you read Matthew chapter six, what Jesus is actually trying to do is stimulate us to faith. You, see, you know, uh, 
Sometimes when you want to know what something is, you've also got to find out what it isn't. If you want to find out what a male is, find out what a male isn't. A male isn't a female. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, 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 so sometimes we have to look at stuff like that, if that makes sense. So anyway, Matthew 6 verse 8, Jesus is saying, he says, therefore do not be like them, don't be like the world. He uses the word Gentiles, which means an unbeliever. He says, for your father, say father, you've got to get a revelation God's your father. You have to. You can't see God as this big almighty being, you know, like an, an angry and, and so unapproachable. He's, he's your father. He's been introduced as a father. Therefore, your father knows the things, say things. Anything can be put into that word things. Anything. Whatever you need of, you can call it a thing. Your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In fact, I don't know where it is. It's probably in Jeremiah or Isaiah somewhere. I'm just reminded of a scripture that God says, before you call, I will answer you. Do you know that that, that scripture is fulfilled every day in our lives? Before we ask God, the provision is already in the earth. Before you ask God for healing, you were healed by the stripes of Jesus. Are you with me? Before you ask God for money for bread, the, the, the fresh bread has already been put in to the, the, the malls or the shops for you to just to go and get. Before we ask, God's already answered. All your provision is already gone ahead of you. You don't realize it. But it takes faith to, to, to draw it out as it were of the the, the, the malls or wherever it is. That's why the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Believe in God. You've got to have faith to the appropriate miracles of provision. That's why Christianity is different from the other life. We trust in our Father who's the creator. That's why you and then we obey we obey the scriptures if we want to have supernatural intervention of provision. Wow. Then Matthew 6 32, we know this. So Jesus says, Your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In Matthew 6 32, for after all these things the Gentiles, the unbelievers seek food, clothing, and shouting, shelter, sorry, stuff like okay. that. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. He knows it. Say that with me. He knows. He knows. Say, Daddy. You know, so why, freak guys, why, why do some of us walk around in like, it's actually unbelief. Unbelief breeds worry. The moment you are starting to worry, I had that last night. Last night I had an overwhelming, uh, of all the things that I need to do, that I need to trust God for, and it was almost like you want to give up because you see it all in one go. But you've got to take one problem at a time. You've got to know God. As long as you know you've tried everything in your power to serve God, God is there for you. God will come through for you. Gosh, we have no shame. Matthew 21, verse 3. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This is Jesus. You know the donkey story when Jesus rode into Jerusalem? On a donkey, in fact, he rode on a donkey and the, the child of a donkey. Uh, two, they, they must have put two things. And the scripture says no one had ever ridden on that donkey, and a donkey, kings rode on donkeys only. So what Jesus was portraying, the king is coming in. And no one had ridden, and Jesus got a word of knowledge. I, I don't know if he had already planned ahead and spoken to someone. But Jesus gives them an instruction on that day, and it was a day that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was a, it was a, it could have been a Sabbath, because it, Jesus said, "You'll see a woman walking with a water pot on her head." It wasn't supposed to have been done. That was out of the ordinary, 
and then you'll find the two donkeys and, and, and bring him to me. And if anyone asks, and then they will they were just take him. You say, the Lord has need of him. Now listen, you've heard me say this before. I want you to see me here. Jesus is the head of, the, of his body. The head is in heaven geographically. The rest of the body, you and I are on earth. The head and the body can never be separated in provision. What is provided for the head is provided for the body. When you eat food, you eat it from your head, but where does it go immediately into? The body. <laughs> so, yeah, Jesus had a supernatural provision. What makes you think that, so yeah, God provided him transport. Royal voice was equivalent to riding a royal voice donkey, told you. Kings rode on donkeys. That's why when he did that, people recognized it. And it's interesting that children were crying Hosanna to the King of Kings. And they were throwing palm, and that's why we call it Palm Sunday. It was, I think it was a Sabbath that they threw palms. They don't even imagine that they had to desecrate the palm trees. They were cutting the palm trees. People couldn't stop them cutting the palm leaves off. And Jesus came down into Jerusalem on a, on a load of palm palm branches. Can you imagine what that must have looked like? <laughs> Just the, the, the road strewn and the palm leaves and everyone's rejoicing at him. But the, the point was that his need was provided. Do you know something God showed me recently or a few years ago? Jesus never lived one day in debt. If he needed 50,000 rand, let's just say, he, he believed God and God provided 50,000 rand's worth of provision. What well, is customary, let's take up our tithes and offering. Uh, in my book that I wrote, Your Prophetic Release, I give a whole lot of names of God. You know, we know God is omnipotent, omniscient, uh, and then, and then I, I looked up a whole lot of other meanings, omnifarious, there's a whole omnis of God. The word omni means all in all. So I want you to write this word down and not forget this word, that Jesus is omnificient. Say omnificient. I hope I pronounced that right. And it simply means our God of all unlimited supply and provision. Say this with me. My God, my God is the God, God of all, all unlimited supply, supply and, provision and provision because he's the creator. And you must never forget that. Omni, om, omnificient. It means he's all providing yeah, and is able to provide and the scripture for it two scriptures for that second corinthians 9 verse 8 and god is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency there we go say all sufficiency, all sufficiency. i think you catch that it means you you lack nothing in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Do you know what a good work is? The ability to pay your accounts. Hello? <laughs> I don't know if you ever thought about that. That's a good work. I have a policy that if I've got a, a lot of accounts, and it might sound like I'm being a bit biased here, but I always pay the Christians first. If I know that company or that person is a Christian, and I owe a lot of Money, uh, 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 I don't fortunately have that problem now, but there was a time when I had a lot of accounts and a lot of debts to pay, but I always made sure, because the Bible says do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. And so I always endeavored to pay the Christian first. Interesting, eh? Because God honors you for that. So that was 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. They, they say in that scripture there are seven superlatives. Have you noticed it didn't just say God is able to make uh, grace abound to you for every good work. Because 
it, it, it could have been put like it, but the scripture says God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency. There's, there's the omni, omnificence of God right there. In all things, may have an abundance for every good work, seven times to the power of the promise, if you can say that. And then we know Philippians 4 verse 19, and my God, who is the creator of heaven and earth. Remember who we're talking about. We're not just talking about a, a dumb idol that people carve out of a piece of wood or stone and they bow down and worship it, or they worship the sun or whatever. That's their God. No, our God is the one that made the sun, that made the earth, that made uh, humanity. And my God, and that God, that same God happens to be our Heavenly Father. Never forget that. He's your daddy. He's your provider. He'll look after you intimately. He'll never leave you nor forsake you, not in any area of your life. He's promised that. My goodness. My God, my Father who's in heaven, shall supply, there we go again, all your need. So think of it. Have you got a need? All will be supplied according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Father, I pray for every person that's linked to this ministry, our local church and those outside the four walls of this building, those around the world, Lord, that are, that are associated with us, that follow us, that are uh, in, in, almost in a sense covenant to uh, this ministry. And those that, are, that bring their tithes and offerings into this ministry and into our ministry, Father, I release in the name and by the blood of Jesus your covenant blessings of you, Father, the greater I am, the one who inhabits eternity, the possessor of heaven and earth, and of the, of the scripture that says, Lord, the earth is yours, all that is in it, and they who dwell therein. And I thank you, you cause people, when we obey you, you will release upon us your favor and the favor of man according to the measure of our obedience, Father. And I release upon us the, your favor and the favor of man. And I decree every need to the tithe and the giver is, will be met in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of poverty, sickness, and death will be breaking the name of the blood of Jesus. In fact, you said one of the, the covenant blessings, you rebuke the devourer. Paul, gosh, Lord, when you rebuke someone, they are finished forever. And we thank you that, Lord, as we obey you with our tithes and offerings, we activate, we activate your covenant of wealth. We activate you as a, as a God of war to go against any debt and spirit of poverty and a spirit of mammon that's trying to bog us down, you go into war against that spirit personally. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for that. Give us a revelation of that. Those that are staggering at the, the promise of the tithe and the giver, Father, open your eyes at that we see. But we know, Father, that we have to just obey unquestionably. Then we'll see. If a farmer has to work out the science of planting a seed, and how it dies and then it germinates, you'll never get that seed into the ground. Because, Lord, even scientists do not know how that a seed dies and then it comes back to life. So if they had to spend all the time trying to work it out before they plant that seed, they will never get a harvest. And that's what some of us are trying to do. We try to reason and question how it's possible. But Lord, you require our unquestionable obedience. There, Father, we'll see miracles of provision. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. You all said, Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and so together. Thank you, Jesus. He, he multiplied bread twice in the space of three or four months to multiply thousands of people. He, 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 when they needed tax money, he didn't have to go and take out a loan. He said, Peter, you know a little bit about fishing? I know you fish with nets, but I want you to fish with a rod now. I want you to go down and catch a fish. The first fish you catch, 
Can I have money in it now? Enough for taxes for you and me don't pay it. That's, that's how we need to live. If the head lived like that, that's what I'm trying to say. But however the head lived on earth, so can the body. As he is, so are we in this life. That's why we, we need to, we, it's just a matter of faith, guys, and hearing God's voice. Because God might tell you to do something. Man, there was a preacher from South Africa. I think his name was Robert Tom. He had five children. His daughter still ministers as a prophetess of Robin Tom. Some of you uh, had, when it was COVID, we had on prophesying over some of us at one stage. And this man had, had such faith, man. He would book into five star hotels without any money. And he traveled the world with his five children. And God would speak to people before he got there. And they would meet him at airports. They would meet him at, at the hotels and say, God said, there's a man by the name of Robert Tom or whatever. Uh, and he had this over and over and over again. Where they would come and just hand him cash, dollars, rands or whatever. And he wasn't a man that, that, that hinted. Apparently he was riding somewhere here in South Africa once and he stopped, he was in a rural area, listen to this, this was the man's faith. He just believed God and he stopped to ask a guy a question and uh, the guy was deaf and dumb. So he already did, he went there into the rebuke that spirit and the guy got healed in the street. And then the guy told him directions and he thank you. Can you imagine when the guy went back to his house? What happened to him? Well, and the moon came and he was talking to me, I couldn't hear him, and he just put his hand on me, and I saw so his mouth move, and suddenly I could talk. He went, where's this man? I think they drove off in the car. Said, well, let's go find him. He's gone already, too. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how his ministry was. Robert Tom, I heard him preach once in the Mulberry Full Gospel Church. Man of faith. And then I remember uh, going overseas with a, a guy by the name of Sona Mahavir, an Indian from Great Town. And he taught me faith. We were, we were, we were, we went to go and preach in Argentina or somewhere, but I remember me panicking about something. And he said, Oh, Richard, God will provide. He, he had that kind of faith. I think he became a pastor. He's going to be the Lord since then. But uh, he, he had such casual faith. He had such faith that like shook me. Pastor Fred was the same. Gosh, if you knew the things that Pastor Fred said to me, oh, don't worry. You know, uh, uh, apparently this is what used to happen when Pastor Fred brought the first Jesus down. You've heard me say this before, and I heard this uh, from one of his congregation members who worked closely with him. In the full time in the ministry, that they would come at about 10 o'clock in the, in the day and they say, Pastor Fred, you need 45,000 rand, uh, you know, to pay the staff or this, and it's Friday and we need the money. And then Pastor Fred would go like this. It's only 10 o'clock, literally, to me, it's half past 10 as I do that. And he said, It's okay, we've got time. It's not four o'clock yet. <laughs> and they said, When four o'clock came, the money was in. Pastor Fred had that faith. He just believed God. And you know, that's how we have to have. God once showed me my very first missionary trip overseas. The Lord gave me a brilliant word that I've never forgotten. And I still use it to this day for faith. I, I had to go to Johannesburg for some uh, training for the youth of the mission. We went to the Lord's soccer games to, to preach there for a whole month in Argentina. Buenos Aires, Cordoba, and Rosario. And we needed to pay for our, our own way. I was, I was a youngster then. And um, so, so I don't know where God shared this with me, but this is the word God gave me. The Lord brought me back to my childhood. One day when we, as a family, all went on I used to live in Johannesburg. I must have been about four years old when I remember this. The Lord said to me, Richard, remember that day when your family caught that red double-decker bus and you went into to Johannesburg, it was with a jeffy on Nugget Street. And I said, yes, Lord, I remember that. The Lord said to me, Richard, who paid for that trip? 
on your festival said to me, whose idea was it to go into, into Johannesburg Town? I said, well, my parents' idea. Okay, it was their idea. So if it was their idea and their decision, did you have to pay for your yourself? I said, no, they, they pay. The Lord said, that's exactly what I will do. If I send you, I will, I will finance the book. Wow, I've never forgotten that. That's, the, that, that's what helped me. Do you know how God provided? When I exercise faith, listen to this. I, uh, Pastor Fred took up an offering for me. I was still going to Mormon for Gospel Church. We needed about 700 rand. I took the money that the church uh, took up for me and I gave it to someone else. The whole bank shoot, I gave it for there and I paid their trip. And, I, and I'm not lying, this is what happened to me. Second time around, I used to live in Stang at that stage. And there was a the mayor, Dr. James and Megan Fanzel, and there was a, he was supposed to preach to the church in Stang, and then there was a banana farmer, Mike Perry. And as I, I was living in a hostel, the railway, railway station was right there, I'm coming out one day, and as I walked into, uh, in, to go across the street, Mike comes up this way, and Megan, who was the mayor's wife, comes up that way. They're both in trucks, so they both stand and look very like, like they, they don't want to go first. So, so then Megan gets out with an envelope, and she said, uh, Richard, this is for you for your trip for Argentina. So I take it, Mike didn't hear what Megan said, she drives off. So Mike takes out a briefcase this big. And he opens it on a bonnet and it's just full of cash from, from whatever. He steps back and he says, Richard, take how much you need for Argentina. Close the case and run. So I said to Mark, I said, hold on a sec, Megan's just giving me an envelope for Argentina. Let me see how much she's putting out. She put the full amount. So you know what I felt to do? I said, can I take another 700 rand? If it was 777 rand. If you look at my uh, my air ticket, I'll never forget. I had to pay 777 rand and 19 cents. <laughs> How's that? So I said, let me take another 700 or whatever rand and let me bless somebody else. Who, because in those days you could fly now, pay later. Now, you may listen to this. I don't know why I'm telling you the story, but this is how God has to trust you with money. So he let me take that money, close his case, went. I, I had that money with me all the way to Argentina. While I was in Argentina, I could have exchanged the money. People were going crazy. They were buying stuff. That money was with me. It was what I call hot money. I wasn't allowed to touch it. I knew. But I had to wait on God. And interestingly enough, the last day, the leadership made, it, made us stand up and he said, is there anyone else, uh, is there anyone here that hasn't paid for your trip yet? And he made everyone stand up. And there was a lot of people, might have already been paid twice, I don't know. So he said, and then he said to the others, I want you to look around, and if you've got any spare cash, I want you to... Uh, Bless them, and three of the South Africans that stood up, I divided that 700 between them. But now listen to this. So when I'm on the aeroplane going back home, I realize I don't have money for an aeroplane flight back to Durban. I'd given all my money out. So I'm sitting in the aeroplane, listen to this. I needed, in those days it was 34 rand and 15 cents or something. A lot of money. For a single trip from. So I'm praying because there's a lot of money. This was 1977, not 1978. So I sit in the aeroplane and I pray. I say, Father, I ask you to provide. You've given me so much money. Surely you can provide the last leg of the trip. Otherwise, I'd have to hitch from Joburg with the suitcases and all that. It wasn't even, I tell you, within an hour, one of the the South African girls comes to me and she says, Richard, I've just come from the toilet and God spoke to me. He said, I must give you this. And she gave me exact amount of money. It was like 34 rand. That's all I knew. It was like 15 cents or something. She said, 
She said, it's a strange thing. He, he gave me like a number, and I even had to put sense in. I, I don't know what it's for. And when I opened, I said, you, you won't believe it. This is exactly what I need to pay for my air ticket to go to, to Durban. So I'm saying that to tell you, as a youngster, I was a tither and a giver, but I had to trust God for all my needs. I came out of abject poverty. I couldn't even ask my parents to provide or sponsor me. I had to trust God. From the age of 17, I started walking by faith. And, and, and these are the scriptures that, that have walked with me for my whole life, for, for 50 years, as I've said. So Philippians 4 verse 19, we know is a sick promise. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. It's a set promise, but listen to the rest of this. Thing. But it is completed only when we obey the preceding condition that we all need to cooperate with God according to verse 17. Verse 17, and I'll read it in a moment, it, it shows that we have to sow a seed. We've got to We've got to release gifts to the ministry. Then we will get to experience the fullness of verse 19. So let me read you Philippians chapter 4, verses 17 to 19. Paul's talking, he says, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. In other words, he's asking him for finances to support his ministry. Then in verse 18, he says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. They sowed into Paul's ministry, just like you do. Do you know that, Pastor Dick, and I, and I want to say it again, that this church supports us as, as, as pastors. And, and we're not only pastors, you know this, but I'm saying it to remind you, we are prophets as well, international prophets. Do you know that you will get such rewards because it may be that God just made us run a church as, because I'm a more of a prophet than a pastor. Pastor Dem is more of a pastor. I'm actually more of a prophet. I'm 80% prophet, 20% pastor. Because my gift is made more for me. You all know that. But you are supporting a prophet. <laughs> Prophets. And if you continue with a, with, with a good heart, willing and obedience, you will get a prophet's reward. It's big. I'm, I'm, I saw that I wrote a little booklet about it. I'm going to have it reprinted again. I felt to do that, to encourage people. Because Jesus said it, not me. Jesus said, if you receive a prophet, in the name of a prophet, you'll get a prophet's reward. And decades ago, the Lord showed me, and I used to do it to Kim Clement. The Lord said to me, uh, the one of the ways you show that you have received a prophet is by the way you give it to the lives or pray for them or support them or serve them. That's how you know you receive a prophet. And, and so Jesus said you'll get a prophet's reward. The prophet's reward is big. You go and read it in my book. For those of you who've got my book, your prophetic release, I, I have it in there. It's mega. <laughs> and so when you partnership and you, that's what God brings you to a church. That's why God sets each member in the body as it pleases Him. Because when you uh, support the ministry like you should, it's not only us, you're supporting the lights here, the, the whole lot of stuff here, you know, the, the, to keep the, you know, the lights going and maintenance, all that. It's, it's your money that's doing it. I don't know if you're aware of it. <laughs> and obviously some of the school money, we've had a big blow in COVID in the school. Because the school used to pay a lot of the bills as well, but I tell you what, we had a big blow. But more than what and it's happened to all the independent schools in South Africa. And ours was one of them where people just didn't have money, so they're taking their children into government schools. And so you agree with us that we get students back in again because the finances were cut more than half. And so we're literally living on a borderline. Uh, Pastor Debbie, we nearly were thinking of closing the school, to be honest with you. And so we, we really believe in God. And I want to just say this, believe with me for, for more students that God will send to the schools. The devil took them out, I believe. Anyway, so can you see that? Uh, 
And having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, watch this when you bring your tons of offerings. Look at what God classes it. He, he, he says, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. Then verse 19 comes in, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Never forget all those three scriptures together. That's why we have the scripture. I, I love the scripture. I quote it often. And I, you need to get a revelation of this, this verse. Hebrews 4 verse 16. That's why, because remember, we God is your father. How many of you, if you did this, then there's something wrong with your parents. If you had to go on your hands and knees and crawl and and beg your parents for supper, beg them for for food, beg them for clothing. Has any of you ever done that to your parents or your children have to do that to you? Is there anyone here? Then why do we do that to our Heavenly Father? We come with this creepy, crawly attitude. Oh God, and, and, and we feel so unworthy. Yet you, his child, stop crawling to the throne. Use the scripture. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. He doesn't use the word ask it. That's what fascinates me. Obtain mercy and find grace in help, to help, sorry, in the time of need. Say need. Do this when you have a need. Practice with the small needs. So that the big needs don't overwhelm you. So that when that Goliath comes, you've already dealt with the sheep and the bears and the little animals. And you say, this uncircumcised Philistine, this, this mountain of the trouble will be just like one of them. Hey, boom. What an amazing scripture. There's another scripture in Hebrews that says, let us come in full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. The word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. That's why I'm such a stickler for you knowing the Bible. Because you can't, you will only know God. You will only know what his mind is, his will, his ways, and his promises are through the written word. You don't know God any other way. God, you only know God through what is what is the covenant book. Say this with me: a deed for a need. <laughs> I'll explain it in the scripture. 1 John 3, verse 17 to 18. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother or sister in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed, a deed for a need, in deed and in truth. Everything in life we need is a provision for thought when we have it. And if it's my words or from the scripture, everything in life we need is a provision for thought when we have it. So we must be givers, we must help. When you see a need, fill it. That, uh, that, that's, that's true love. God so loved it, gave. Remember that. We love him because he first loved us. And we have to love those that he loves. And <laughs> a lot of people that God loves, we don't like. You've heard me say that so many times. I might not like you, but I love you. You might not like me, but you command me to love me. Love overrides like. <laughs> Oh my goodness, the Lord showed me that decades ago. I might not like you, but I have to love you. I'm commanded to love you, therefore I'm commanded to give to you. Uh, what I'm, my job is to give you the word. My job, that's my job, that's my calling, is to break. I'm the, the Bible calls the master of the sins, who, who, who gives you the scripture. It's for the Ecclesiastes. That's my job to give you a word in season and it's your responsibility to take the word that's preached and apply it and believe it and run with it and, and activate it in your life. I can't believe for you. Do you know that? Hello? Turn to someone and say, I can't believe for you. 
You have to believe for yourself. Can I give you a scripture for that? The scripture for that has been written four times. Once in the Old Testament and three times in the New Testament. You'll recognize it when I say it. But the original goes like this. The just shall live by their own faith. I think the first time it was written was in Habakkuk and maybe Galatians, Hebrews and some other scripture. Three times in the New Testament, one time in the Old Testament, the just is there any just people out there? Can I have a wave of that if you just? The Bible calls you just. The Bible says that just, the, the, the spirits of, the, of just men have been made perfect. It's in Hebrew somewhere. Gosh, we, we've, got to, we've got to recognize too when God needs us. Do you know that there's times when God needs you to do something? And never forget this, God is not in part. That which a person sows, they shall reap. So when you meet God's needs, He will meet your needs. That's what happened to Pastor David now many, many years ago. We had just got married. We had nothing. We had we were in a bachelor flat. My, our wardrobe was a washing line uh, from one screw to the wall, and another screw, and then we, we screwed two screws in the wall, and then we had a washing line. That was our wardrobe. They hung our clothes on the coat hanger. We were had a borrowed a fridge that high. A fridge that big. Yes, you get fridges that big. A one plate little stove, all borrowed. A, a borrowed bed from our mom. And then, then a, 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 I think I bought, I think I bought it. it was a couch from, I remember from Zimbabwe that I, that I slept at an angle. Pastor Debbie slept on a single bed, I slept my kid. We had nothing. When we got married, I did a silly thing. I resigned my job on honeymoon. But then, there's a reason why I did it. It's out of conscious sake. So one day God speaks to me. And I knew exactly what he meant. He said, Richard, if you obey me, I'll obey you. If you meet my needs, I'll meet your needs. And I knew the biggest need that God has on the face of this earth is for people to get saved. He's not willing that one perish and they all come to repentance. That's another way to make money, by the way. When you get out there and tell people about Jesus, God's supernatural provision will come on you because you're meeting his biggest need on earth. And Pastor David and I inaugurated another church. Toti went to go and ask the pastor permission, can we go take some people from the church, preach on the streets. We started at the Namsen Toti Post Office, then we went into Sunland Center, for six months. We caused a traffic jam that they eventually had to close our ministry down. People were queuing up for prayer. The, the miracles were happening in the street. Yeah, it's like a total post office. Station was just there. There were queues of people waiting for prayer. And I would prophesy while I was preaching. And in that six months, total strangers came up to Pastor Debra and just gave us, you know the story. Some, I, I repeated some of those because people were hearing this for the first time. All our needs were provided in six months. Car was given to us. We moved into a better flat, uh, apartment or whatever, uh, just fridges and stoves. In fact, the, the stuff, there was stuff that was given to us that I gave to the church. There was an overflow. We, we gave it into the local church. I could have kept it for myself. Gave it, caused, caused, uh, giving to flow into the church for six months. Every provision provided. And that's why I tell people there's another way to make money. Go and be a witness, go and be a soul winner. Watch God come through for you. I've seen it. Uh, Pastor Debbie's aunt was a great soul winner. Her husband was a mechanic and he never, he, he, was, he was a, a mechanic on his own. It's only on his own, but the money just poured into their lives. And she won people to Christ. And I've seen the, some of the biggest churches in the world. You'll find evangelists have the biggest churches because they pull in people. Give us this day. Or, or, I'll say that because I want you to go to scripture. I'm ready for this. John 4, verse 4. 
There's a scripture that says Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Interesting phrase, John 4 verse 4. He must needs go through Samaria. I must needs go through Samaria. Samaria was a place of apartheid with the, with the Jews. The Samaritan and Jews were in apartheid. <laughs> so you think Jesus never had apartheid. He obeyed God's voice. And he went through, and you know the story? Word of knowledge, woman gets saved, goes and tells the whole village. They come and see Jesus. He stays there for another two days, and he starts a church there. In Acts chapter 8, we hear of a revival breaking out in this church that Jesus started in Samaria. <laughs> Through the woman at the well, she probably became the pastor. Who knows? And uh, so when God wants you to uh, go and the fields are white unto to others, don't resist him. Don't resist the spirit. Tell others about Jesus. And Jesus prayed this way, give us this day our daily provision. But we must see God's needs and meet his needs. We've got two more scriptures and then finished. How pastors do the following unto the Lord. Say this to your neighbor, help the pastor. Help the pastor. Do the following. As unto the Lord. Watch this interesting scripture. Ezra 6 verse 9. And whatever they need, this is the king telling the people to provide for the priests. And whatever they need, young bulls, grains, lambs for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the requests, the requests or requisition of the priests who are in Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail. It was an instruction that whatever the priests need, and you can see there's a lot of money, honey, in that offering, those offerings. Bulls on cheap, rams were cheap, lambs were cheap, wheat, that to be wheat, salt, wine, and oil, expensive commodities. That's why when God says, bring your tithes and offerings, He is saying, do not let the priests go without. Do not let the local church go without. He that knows to do good and does it not to him it is sin. I still tithe to this day. I'm a tither. I don't care what Mr. Cliffel O'Donnell said about tithing. He's going to stand before God one day and, and, and give an account. He might even lose his salvation by saying, comes with all the scriptures. <clears throat> covenant breaker. The Bible says in the last days there will be covenant breakers. He's broken the covenant of the of the of Abraham. Strong words. I don't know what they'll do with it on YouTube, but anyway. Shock to the body of Christ. Men of that caliber getting up and saying they have to tithe. Do you know what he's done? He's just, he's just stepped into the place of the thief. He sided with the devil. If tithing is of God, which I believe it is, Trifle Dollar says, you don't have to tithe anymore. He's standing against Christ. He's standing on the side of the devil. He goes to steal, kill him, and destroy. And he's robbing people of the blessings of God that make rich and add no sorrow. And of the covenant sevenfold reward that God speaks of in Malachi 3 verse 16. Tithing is of the Abrahamic covenant. And Galatians 3 verse 1 says, If you are Abrahams, then you belong to Christ as well. And inheritors of the blessing. And the Bible calls that a doctrine of devils. Doctrine of devils. Please, Lord Jesus. I don't know what made me say that, but I have to say that's a prophet of coming. <laughs> Last scripture. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 21. 
And in the scripture, let me tell you what's coming. Jesus is actually saying that he needs us and we need him. Watch this. He's talking about the, the unity of the body. He's not talking about a physical body. He's talking about the body of Christ. He says, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head, watch this. Look at me, the head to the feet. Jesus is the head of the body. You might be the lowest part of the body. You might be the little toe. Even Jesus is saying, I cannot say I don't need you. We all need each other. Even Jesus. You know, um, if you heard the one devotion, I'm not a bit behind. If you heard the one devotion that I said where, where you had, they had to put the blood on the right earlobe, the right thumb, I think it is, and the right big toe. You, you, that's sanctified. You know, if you cut your big toe off, you, you, your body can't balance. Your whole body needs just that big toe. Try, try and do that. Try and walk without using your big toe. You'll see, you'll see how you look. And even your little pinky toe, it catches on. It somehow it, it helps to balance. It's amazing how God made us. And, and, and the scripture says that the, the unseemly parts of the body are the most important. Take, take out your, what's it, liver? Where's uh, Auntie Joyce? No, we, uh, Auntie, uh, Auntie Joyce, let's ask her. Can, can a person live without their liver? You'll die. How big is a liver? Just show me from where you are. Is it about, about that size? And we've only got one, hey? Excuse my ignorance. Take out your liver, guys. I don't need you. I, I want to try something else. Woo. I'm going to do this one time finished. <laughs> Can you see that? We need each other. Don't ever say I don't need this person or that person. You don't let her do it. You don't have permission. That's why you count in this local church. You count in the kingdom of God. Don't, don't don't let the devil say you don't count. You don't have to have a pulpit ministry or an elder or deacon or a musician. Just the fact that you come and you support and you pray and you, you bring in your coal that's helping the fire burn. And you will get your reward for it. Let's stand and pray. Did you get something out of this part where it's not too? I think it's going to say. Father, in the name and love of the blood of Jesus, I ask you to be the after preacher, the follower, word, Holy Spirit to us. And whenever we read the scriptures more, or we, we're walking and, and going at our daily business, that you'll just continue to remind us you're our provider, you're our comforter, strengthener, standby. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. Not in any area of our lives. That's why in that same scripture you said, don't be covetous. I mean, be covetous. Don't be greedy because I'll, I'll never leave you. Be content with the things that you have. Rest in your faith. Believe that I, your Father in heaven, will never, never let anyone pluck you out of my hand. Or you will not go without. If my son Jesus didn't go without, then my body will not go without. If you need this the Lord. Father, we, we just repent and we ask you for forgiveness of, 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 of not trusting you to supply our daily needs. We ask you for that. We, we, we just repent of that. In Jesus' name, Father. You all said, Amen. Thank you for watching. We know you received something encouraging to empower your relationship with Christ. Please take advantage of our other materials by Richard and Deborah. Should you desire to bless and support this ministry, please use the following details to impart your blessing. May the Lord return the favor to you a thousandfold according to Deuteronomy 1 verse 11. Should you be in the vicinity of Peter Marisburg in KZN, you are welcome to attend our church service at International Christian Center Peter Marisburg. 
located at 28 Pilot Road, Epworth. Our times are as follows, at 9 a.m. in the morning. If you have never surrendered your life to Christ or need to recommit to the Lord Jesus, please pray this prayer to God now. Dear God, our Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus to be my Savior. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. As I ask you to forgive and cleanse me of all of my sins by the power of your shed blood, I receive you as my Savior, Lord and friend. As you make me your child today, Thank you again, Father, for the indescribable gift of eternal life in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the Lord lead you to a Bible-based church. Alternatively, contact us to be of assistance in this important next step of your relationship with Christ. God bless Richard and Deborah Gray.